Hi, I'm Kathy Parker, the School Library Media Consultant for the Department of Public Instruction. Thank you for joining me to review the steps of the evaluation instrument for School Library Media Coordinators. I've developed this webcast for those who will be evaluating School Library Media Coordinators and so that media coordinators themselves may have a better understanding of the process. Also, there have been some recent changes to the process that we need to make sure we understand, and I hope this webcast will support you as you seek to better understand the evaluation process. So in this webcast, I'm going to explain each of the steps of the evaluation process. While all of the documents required for the School Library Media Coordinator Evaluation Instrument are housed on the NIECES Wiki, including the Evaluation Instrument User's Guide, as an evaluator or a school library media coordinator, you will be accessing the actual instrument through home base. It's important to note that school library media coordinators must be set up with the correct code to be recognized as school library media coordinators by the home base system. These codes are imported from payroll. So if the system recognizes your library media coordinator as, for example, a classroom teacher, check with payroll to determine if the problem is the object code being imported. The NISA's object code for school library media coordinators is 131 and their purpose code is 5810. We know that in practice school library media coordinators are certified teachers whose instructional leadership and instructional practices are evident in their professional standards, especially standard one and four. But to connect with the School Library Media Coordinator's evaluation tool in the home base system, they must be distinguished from classroom teachers using the accurate object code. In addition, unlike classroom teachers, library media coordinators do not have a career abbreviated evaluation option. So as an evaluator, you'll want to make sure that you haven't identified your School Library Media Coordinators in the staff list as career abbreviated. Now let's take a look at the components of the evaluation process. You can find this evaluation tutorial page linked on this webcast's wiki, and it houses a link to the complete evaluation instrument user's guide, whose updated version was posted this past November. It also houses a thing link of the evaluation process, which we will look at more closely, as well as past broadcasts related to the instrument, and a webcast and information on scoring the rubric. Now a change in the evaluation instrument that we need to be aware of is that there is no longer probationary and career status. Instead, the two types of evaluation cycles are comprehensive and standard. School library media coordinators with less than three consecutive years of employment are on the comprehensive cycle and school library media coordinators with more than three years of employment may be evaluated on either cycle and that choice is up to the local education agency. As we go through the steps of the process, I'll point out the differences that exist depending on the cycle type. The first component of the evaluation process is training which could come in a variety of types, including training that a local education agency has provided, Department of Public Instruction training, etc. So principals, school library media coordinators, and peer evaluators should be trained on the process. Peer evaluators may be new to some of you since they were not included in this process in years past. So let me spotlight that peer evaluators are part of the comprehensive evaluation cycle, and we'll talk more about that when we get to the observation step. Step two, as a principal, is to provide your school library media coordinator with the rubric and the teacher evaluation policy, as well as a schedule as to when the evaluation components will be completed. This should take place within two weeks of the school library media coordinator's first day. Now as principal, you may choose to provide your school library media coordinator with a copy of these items, either print or digital, or you may give your school library media coordinator directions for obtaining access to these items. 
The next step is a self-assessment where the school library media coordinator goes through the rubric and rates him or herself. Something that I share with school library media coordinators is that completing this self-assessment can be very useful because it may focus your attention on terminology or concerns to discuss or clarify with your principals in the pre-observation conference, which is the next step. So something that I will also recommend to an evaluator is that prior to the pre-observation conference, you may want to go through the rubric descriptors as well and note terminology or concerns to discuss and clarify with your school library media coordinator because it's important that both the evaluator and the school library media coordinator have the same understanding of the rubric descriptors and the same expectations. And this process is really a partnership between the evaluator and the school library media coordinator. In the pre-observation conference, the principal and school library media coordinator go over the self-assessment, the school library media coordinator's current professional growth plan, and the lesson that's going to be observed. Notice that the pre-observation conference is not just about the upcoming observation. It's an opportunity to go over rubric performance indicators. It's a time to discuss terminology and expectations for the upcoming year. For example, if your school library media coordinator is in a library on a fixed schedule, as an evaluator, you may want to use this pre-conference to discuss the performance indicators for Standard 1 and Standard 3 relating to providing an open, equitable, accessible, and flexible learning environment, and together discuss how this can be achieved or possibly discuss the performance indicators regarding leading professional development and brainstorm how these indicators can be accomplished on the current schedule or how more flexibility can be built in the schedule to support these school library media coordinator responsibilities. Or you may want to use this opportunity to discuss rubric terminology like social and participatory learning or leading in creating a 21st century learning environment and what these look like in practice. Discussions like this can help ensure that the evaluator and the library media coordinator have a shared vision and shared expectations of what certain performance indicators look like in practice when they are being implemented. Something else to note about the pre-observation conference is that it is not required for subsequent observations. The observation is the next step in the evaluation process and observations are determined by the school library media coordinator's evaluation cycle type. So if the school library media coordinator has not been employed for at least three consecutive years, he or she follows a comprehensive evaluation cycle and his or her evaluator conducts a minimum of three formal observations on the school library media coordinator's performance. In addition, school library media coordinators on the comprehensive cycle will also have one formal peer observation. If a school library media coordinator has been employed for three or more years, then he or she will follow either a comprehensive cycle or a standard evaluation cycle, which is at the district's discretion. If the standard evaluation cycle is used, then the evaluator conducts at least three observations, one of which is formal, while the other two may be formal or informal. And formal observations are 45 minutes or an entire lesson, while informal observations are at least 20 minutes. In the post-observation conferences for formal observations, the school library media coordinator and the principal discuss performance and document on the rubric strengths and weaknesses from the observed session or lesson. And this conference should occur no later than 10 school days after the observation. The summary evaluation conference occurs at the end when the components of the process are complete and the evaluator and school library media coordinator will discuss the school library media coordinator's self-assessment, the school library media coordinator's professional growth plan, components of the evaluation process, observations, and artifacts. Then the principal will give a rating for each element in the rubric, making written comments on any not demonstrated elements, determining an overall rating for each rubric standard, giving the school library media coordinator the opportunity to add comments on the summary rating form, 
reviewing the summary writing form with the school library media coordinator and getting the school library media coordinator's signature on the record of school library media coordinator evaluation activities and the summary writing form. The last step is the professional growth plan for next year. And the School Library Media Coordinator formulates this taking into consideration observations from this year. For example, goals may be formulated based on areas that the observations showed needed improvement. And there are three types of professional growth plans. The individual growth plan, which is for media coordinators rated proficient or better on all standards. The monitored growth plan for media coordinators rated developing on at least one standard and not recommended for dismissal, demotion, or non-renewal, and the directed growth plan for media coordinators rated not demonstrated on any standard or developing on one or more standards for two sequential years and not recommended for dismissal, demotion, or non-renewal. The evaluation instrument is really the state's vision of digital age school library media programs. And we can look at the professional standards and specific performance indicators on their rubric to see what activities and practices really characterize contemporary library media coordinators, their programs and their services. So now that I've reviewed the evaluation process, Let's focus attention on the rubric descriptors, which are also referred to as performance indicators, and think about what some of those look like in action. And the rubric descriptors are found in the developing, proficient, accomplished, and distinguished columns of the rubric. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to identify some specific performance indicators and brainstorm what they may look like in a school library media coordinator's practice. Now the caveat to this is that what I review will not be an exhaustive list. One of the great things about the School Library Media Coordinator Professional Standards and Rubric is that its creators really recognize that the nature of a School Library Media Coordinator's work will vary based on the characteristics and the needs of his or her teachers and students. The needs of students and faculty in a rural school may not be the same as those in an urban setting. The needs of elementary age students and teachers will be different from that of high school. Um, and school environments, even within the same grade level, will vary greatly as well. An advantage of this rubric is that it's flexible. And the rubric is not prescriptive in the sense that it does not specify how a school library media coordinator must meet the performance indicators. Therefore, school library media coordinators have the flexibility to use the strategies that work for their schools. Sometimes the danger in describing what something looks like is that some viewers may interpret that as it must look like this or it can only look like this. So let's make sure that we don't restrict our school library media coordinators to implementing a performance indicator in only one particular way. I've chosen several performance indicators that I frequently get questions about, so we're going to start by reviewing those, but I also invite you to contact me anytime regarding a performance indicator that you may want my input on. I'd like to start by bundling several performance indicators that relate to delivering professional development. I'm choosing to start with professional development because school library media coordinators providing training to teachers is a necessity in a modern library media program. And research shows that schools where the school library media coordinator delivers professional development to teachers have higher student achievement. And when we're making decisions about our school library media programs and services that our media coordinators can provide, we need to have the best interest of our students in the forefront. So media coordinators delivering professional development to teachers can impact teacher effectiveness and thereby improve student achievement. So it's what's best for our students. And when we look at the rubric, we'll see that the state recognizes the importance of media coordinators delivering professional development because there are numerous performance indicators, both directly and indirectly, related to delivering professional development. And you can see some of those on the screen. 
We see from the performance indicators that digital age school library media coordinators in North Carolina are expected to deliver professional development on a variety of topics such as digital literacy issues like copyright, instructional strategies for diverse student needs such as maybe universal design for learning or differentiation. And that makes me think about a Wise Owl Wednesday uh, webinar. That is, and there's one that's archived from Britannica um, that was aired not too long ago on differentiated instruction. And this is professional development that school library media coordinators could lead and share with their teachers. Notice that the performance indicator on technology-enabled professional development is left wide open. There's no detail on what that professional development is about. So as a school library media coordinator, this gives me the flexibility to uh, do a variety of things. I could conduct a needs assessment with my teachers, maybe through word of mouth, maybe through professional learning community discussions. Maybe I've had conversations with the leadership team that I'm a part of. Or maybe I use a, something like a Google form survey and uh, collect the results and use those results to determine what professional development I deliver that would be most useful to my teachers. This coupled with the uh, performance indicator related to delivering professional development on integrating information and instructional technology is really critical in our technology rich environments, especially in our bring your own device environments or our one-to-one -one environments where our teachers desperately need high quality relevant professional development so that they can effectively implement instruction in these environments. Um, some other things that I may do as a media coordinator to help fulfill and implement this performance indicator and other performance indicators related to professional development are things like delivering professional development in the professional learning communities or maybe I have Media Mondays or Technology Tuesdays or possibly I post uh, self-paced how-to videos on my school library media website for teachers. Maybe I get time on the agenda at faculty meetings where I um, lead mini lessons or workshops on teacher work days or lunch and learns where maybe teachers come to the library during their lunch or I could even do after school professional development sessions. Now if you're a principal at a school where the media coordinator is not involved in delivering professional development we need to do some problem solving and the first place would be to identify the obstacles and remove them. So to identify roadblocks, a question I might ask is, are flexible structures in place to support these performance indicators related to delivering professional development? Because being able to provide professional development for teachers during the school day, in uh, professional learning communities, through lunch and learns, those kinds of activities would mean that as a school library media coordinator, I would need flexibility built into my schedule or support staffing that would enable me to deliver that professional development at my teacher's point of need. Yes, I can still deliver professional development to my staff while operating on a fixed schedule um, through virtual options, but some of my teachers may learn better in a face-to-face -face environment, which would require that as a media coordinator, I be present in real time. Um, as the library media consultant for the state, I'm sometimes asked by administrators and media coordinators alike how to implement flexible access given some constraints that schools face. And I have a few examples from the field that I'll share so that you can determine if they would work in your school environment. Also, I'm happy to share contact information with you so that you can speak to these media coordinators or principals yourself to get more details about how they make a flexible schedule work. Just send me an email asking for that contact and I'll be glad to give you that information. Um, one elementary school reported to me that its library is able to operate flexibly because the teachers have a planning period provided by other connect classes, is what they were called for this school, such as music, art, computer, and PE. And for several years, the PE teacher had each class twice a week, so two classes at a time, and art, music, and computer were once a week. 
currently that particular school is on a four-day rotation with each class seeing the extra class uh, once before starting over. And the school library media coordinator reported that this schedule has worked well for the school and the music art and computer teachers like not having uh, each class the same day. And in the past they had problems, especially with Monday classes, uh, when they would miss school the same day several weeks in a row, um, so the teachers would not see those classes. Similarly, a principal at an elementary school um, on a flexible schedule shared with me that his school operates on a five-day rotation for specialty classes, music, art, computer, and PE, and the students go to PE twice each week. So the media center doesn't have to be used for specialty classes. The principal noted that this was possible because of the commitment of his district, which allows the school to have the specialty classes that it offers. And the school doesn't have to share specialty teachers with other schools, so that enables them to offer the flexible media schedule. He also noted that the schedule allows teachers to collaborate with the media coordinator to design and implement special learning activities with students, um, such as those related to research skills that are vital to those students. Another elementary school uh, that has operated on a flexibly uh, scheduled library media program for six years was able to make it work in part by having an assistant one day a week for every time slot in their schedules. Um, so that assistant would work in the media center so that the media coordinator had the opportunity to schedule classes for collaborative lessons in the media center, as well as work with teachers during their planning periods to provide professional development opportunities uh, or for planning collaborative units. And these are just a few of the ways that some of North Carolina's elementary schools are building in flexibility for the library media program. So what are ways you can support your library media program by building in flexibility where you can? All of our school environments and resources are different, so there's not one solution that I can give you. I think the takeaway is that anything you can do um, as a leader to build in flexible time in the library schedule will facilitate collaborative functions uh, that have been shown to have an impact on student achievement and are reflected in the state's professional standards such as co-teaching, delivering professional development to teachers, leading professional learning communities, those kinds of things. Maybe flexibility isn't preventing your school library media coordinators from delivering professional development. Maybe there's another obstacle. Whatever it may be, the key is to identify the roadblock and work with school library media coordinators to overcome it so that media coordinators implement their professional standards and improve teacher effectiveness in our schools. Maybe the evaluation instrument will springboard conversations with your school library media coordinators on this topic. Before I leave the topic of professional development, I want to give a shout out to some North Carolina School Library media coordinators and instructional technology facilitators who offer some exciting professional development opportunities for their teachers in the form of professional development challenges. If you are a School Library media coordinator or an administrator who would like ideas on ways to implement more professional development with your teachers, you may consider contacting these individuals regarding their aptitude teacher professional development challenge and their contact information is on the wiki page for this library media and technology tidbit webcast mindy Lori, ann and renee of rowan salisbury school system have some really innovative professional development practices that may benefit your teachers as well not only are these school library media coordinators and instructional technology facilitators implementing their professional standards regarding professional development, but their collaboration with each other really sets a great example of the power of the partnership between instructional technology facilitators and school library media coordinators while implementing other professional standards, those regarding collaboration. Another performance indicator that I've received questions about is this one that you see on participating in the recruitment hiring process and or mentoring of school-based educators. And this performance indicator from Standard 1 
really demonstrates a shift in expectations of school library media coordinators from simply being leaders in their library media programs to being leaders in their schools. And this performance indicator can spotlight a few things for us to keep in mind with all of the performance indicators on the rubric. First, with this, you have to make sure that you really look at what the indicator says. It's an and or statement. So to meet this performance indicator, I can either participate in the hiring process or I can mentor other educators or I can do both. Again, the rubric doesn't dictate how I implement this in my practice. The part of this that I get questions about is how can school library media coordinators, you know, participate in the hiring process. So as a school library media coordinator, I could formally participate in the process by being part of an interview team. But what if my school doesn't use interview teams? Is being on an interview team the only way that I can participate in the hiring process? No, absolutely not. Um, let's suppose as a school library media coordinator, I know that this summer my principal will be interviewing for several teaching positions. Um, maybe I want to propose possible interview questions to my administrator. I mean, as a library media coordinator, technology integration is in my wheelhouse, so I may have a useful perspective on questions to ask potential candidates about technology integration in the classroom. Or maybe I'm aware of a great journal article that came out recently about skills contemporary teachers need. And I share that with my principal so that she can consider it when interviewing potential hires. Um, since as a school library media coordinator, I have earned both a bachelor's and master's degree, I may have university contacts that my principal may want me to get in touch with to solicit potential candidates. So there are a variety of ways that as a media coordinator, I could lead in my school and participating in the hiring process is just one of those ways. The main takeaway here is the leadership piece that's obvious in the first professional standard for library media coordinators. A contemporary library media program requires a school library media coordinator who leads in his or her school and an administrator who shares this leadership vision of the school library media coordinator and supports that role. This year I worked with Bertie County's library media coordinators who brainstormed what this performance indicator relating to partnering with other libraries and community organizations might look like. And they come up with some really good ideas uh, that may benefit library media coordinators and administrators working with those library media coordinators such as collaborating with public library staff to develop lessons or presentations on topics like copyright law, presenting sessions in school and at the public library on these topics, collaborating with colleagues in the district and in community organizations like law enforcement to produce or publish materials or presentations about online safety, cyberbullying, leading parent night sessions where the school library media coordinator teaches about online safety, appropriate online behavior, dangers of cyberbullying. This year, um, after speaking about school libraries during the keynote of the North Carolina Library Association's recent conference, I was really excited by the interest that some public librarians have in partnering with school libraries. If you'd like other ideas of ways to partner with the public library, you may want to take a look at the Digital Shift Conference archive. This conference um, included a webcast on a collaborative endeavor between a public library and a local elementary school uh, who implemented a parent workshop tech night. And I've shared this information um, in the past with the North Carolina School Library Media Coordinator and Instructional Technology Facilitator and Moto Group, but I've also shared a link to that conference on this Library Media and Technology Tidbits Wiki page if you want to refer to it. I get questions from school library media coordinators on how to use data in our practice for data-driven decision making and this performance indicator from standard three relates to that. 
So let's say that as a school library media coordinator, I review uh, collection management plan data, and that may be quantitative data from a collection analysis that I ran from my library's automation system, which shows gaps in my collection where I need resources to meet students' reading interest or resources to meet curricular needs and is reflected in my collection management plan or circulation usage statistics that I gathered to inform my collection management plan. Or maybe the data is budgeting funding data uh, from my plan. It may also be qualitative data that I collected from students and teachers or other library stakeholders through surveys, verbal communication, uh, maybe a suggestion box, those kinds of things, and that informs my plan. So I use that data to determine collection needs and identify external resources mentioned in this performance indicator. Um, and those may be in the form of print or digital or human resources that will help me meet those needs. So maybe I partner with the public library to determine what resources it has available that may help fill some of my gaps. And then we have reading drives or public library card drives. For example, I know of an elementary school library media coordinator in Pitt County who sponsored a summer library card drive with the public library. And when parents picked their kids up from school at the end of the year, public library staff was on hand to help them get a public library card. When I was a school library media coordinator, knowing that my school library had limited research resources, I worked with my local public library who sent a representative to teach an English class about public library research resources that they could access in the course of their research projects. So implementing this indicator may involve partnering with other libraries to bridge the gaps for students and teachers at your school as a media coordinator. Um, it may be that as a result of this data, especially funding data, as a media coordinator, I've realized that my library doesn't have funding to purchase the resources that my collection management plan indicates that my students and teachers really need. So I solicit funding from grants and other organizations like maybe Donors Choose or Bright Ideas. Or maybe I partner with an eligible library, such as a public library or a university library, and apply for an LSTA grant. Or possibly I could share my collection plan data with my local parent-teacher organization to solicit funding um, or donations from the community that would help me develop my collection. These are just a few activities that school library media coordinators could implement for this performance indicator. Now before I wrap up this uh, library media and technology tidbit webcast on the evaluation process, I do want to take a brief moment to address artifacts. Artifacts are um, anything that's a natural byproduct of implementing one's performance indicators. So emails, collaborative documents, lesson plans, student work samples, calendars, presentations, agendas, uh, meeting minutes, professional development attendance rosters, these types of things are all artifacts that would be natural byproducts of a school library media coordinator implementing his or her standards. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. These are just some examples. And you can find other examples in the supporting documents on the NIECES wiki. Artifacts are really necessary because many of the roles and responsibilities that school library media coordinators perform are not observed by uh, evaluators. Because as already mentioned, the evaluator usually only observes the school library media coordinator three times and a peer evaluator only once uh, for a comprehensive evaluation cycle. And even when a principal visits the library periodically or interacts with the school library media coordinator in leadership meetings or um, professional learning communities, it's just a small snapshot of the school library media coordinator's activities. So the artifacts are essential for the school library media coordinator to document his or her performance and so that a principal will have an expansive view of the school library media coordinator's role. 
school library media coordinators should embrace this as an opportunity to really showcase their work. So in this webcast, I've reviewed the evaluation process, identified uh, what some of the performance indicators may look like, and defined artifacts. If any viewer needs additional support um, regarding the evaluation instrument, I encourage you to contact me or your digital teaching and learning regional consultant as needed. I would love to have feedback from you about this webcast and I encourage you to complete the feedback form that I've included on the webcast wiki page. It'll only take you a couple of minutes and it'll enable me to do some data-driven decision making of my own for future professional development. Thank you for viewing this webcast. I hope that you found it was beneficial to your work.